So going further, today what we are looking at uh, doing is from learning outcome two, we will get into something called learning outcome three. And here the idea would be to understand um, uh, you know, key things which are um, in terms of, you know, what we want to do is slightly understand the categorization of the travel and tourism market. So the first part is what we're going to be focusing on is primarily to understand how the categorization of uh, you know the industry happens. How big is this industry? So we will try and look at it on a, a map in terms of what are the various key sectors uh, within this uh, uh, you know travel and tourism and hospitality industry. We will look at understanding some of them in a bit more detail. So I put together some slides which basically would then look at explaining the main types. Uh, or the key types that we want to identify, and then what are their functions and how and what services they provide when we look at, say, a particular sector. So things like, you know, food and beverage could be one, accommodation could be one, airlines could be one. So we'll identify all of those, um, you know, broad sectors, and within that we'll study their roles and what is their contribution to the overall, uh, you know, industry or the sector in general. We'll also look okay. at the concept of something called vertical and horizontal integration. And we'll start off with the definitions of understanding what is vertical integration and uh, what is horizontal integration. And then in this case, what we want to be able to do is study or look at any, any example, one example which will help us understand this concept and why and under what conditions, you know, these kind of mergers and acquisitions or essentially um, what you look at is, uh, you know, takeovers essentially happen. And why does it make sense for, uh, you know, key players in the market to look at vertical and horizontal integration? So I put together a few slides here just to uh, look at dwelling into this concept and then we'll pick this up as a bit of an example. Now, along with this particular task in the learning outcome, what we also want to be able to do is understand, which I briefly mentioned things like after, at all, you know, some of the key organizations which are a part and parcel of this particular sector. And over the years, they have, uh, you know, their role and function has become quite important because they help in either, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that there is a legislation and law which applies one and all or similar laws and legislation apply across all tour operators, travel agents and other things, other, you know, participatory, uh, you know, players in this market. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what we want to be able to do is also understand that some of these players are global bodies and they help in creation of legislation, which then becomes at some stage a norm or a de facto standard in the uh, in the industry and helps consumers and helps the operators protect against, you know, untowards instances or, you know, in, in cases, um, uh, say, or in, in situations which, you know, are non um, non-congenial for business, which leads to, you know, losses and things like that. So you'll understand a few organizations which are put together a few slides and definitions for. And lastly, what mm -hmm. we want to do is we've covered the classification of tourism, you know, to a certain extent, why people travel, um, you know, and what is the classification when we talk about things like medical tourism, travel, uh, for education, business professional. But here in this task, what we want to be able to look at is uh, we would classify tourism, activity tourism, in particular, then we look at classification of tourism activities. And to a certain extent, what we can also look at is the classification of a tourist in terms of uh, when they travel for a particular reason. And the idea would be to try and understand uh, why classification is required. What are the challenges the classification is, uh, you know, when you try and do the classification you face? And then how does classification actually help the operators or the players in this industry to look at Obviously, driving tourism and tourism activities. It's, it's, it's a quite extensive learning outcome, and uh, I think a quite an interesting one because this will help us really understand, you know, what tourism and tourism, uh, you know, uh, activities. It takes us back to the very initial beginnings of understanding, or what we get to see on television, in magazines, and you know, advertising in general. I think we'll be able to correlate to a lot of things that we see currently on some of the slides that I put together. Now, my slides are not that graphic, but you know, I, I if I had a bit more time, I would find kind of you know make them a bit more graphic. But uh, some of the real-time concepts which are coming in now, uh, which have really become possible after 2012, 2015, I would put it this way: the new concepts and ideas which are coming out of Silicon Valley. You know, things like uh, when we look at Uber as a taxi saving service. Now, uh -huh. that is not directly a part of travel and tourism industry. That kind of an idea has actually revolutionized 
cab sharing or cab service essentially uh, you know wherever they've introduced in the world so i think they are present okay. about in 28 29 countries at this moment but wherever they are present because of the availability of telecom and other technology technological factors uh, this technology then allows you know users to book a cab uh, from a smartphone so we will look at some of the particular um, you know um, let's put it this way similar innovations which are currently embracing uh, the tourism and hospitality sector and how things are changing and becoming easier for consumers to get holiday and holiday packages so i'll try and obviously bring across some current examples which is which are relevant when we look at classification in general but i think um, as some of them you know we'll look at i'll open up some websites just to you know to show you and give you some direction in terms of where to look at a bit more reading uh you know to to get the current concepts so if you have any okay. questions as always you know just stop me in the middle and you know what we'll do we'll look at those queries and questions uh, as we go along so sure. now let, let's look at the first one the first part basically talks about you know how do we uh, look at identifying the main sectors or main you know, responsibilities within this particular uh, you know big industry or big sector as we call it which is travel tourism and hospitality now uh -huh. this is a good uh, map or a good picture which actually players uh, which actually make up this industry so when we talk about hospitality industry or tnh in general we don't include the word travel because travel is actually initiating out of uh, out of this particular sector so tourism and hospitality is the sector and the activity which we, uh, people undertake when they look at associating with this sector would be travel in in general so when we look at that let's look at you know the five or six broad types of uh, you know um, um, you know i would say pillars which make up this industry you now one of the key pillars that we look at is uh, food industry or food food services you know, there are different types of cover but food is a very important part of this sector because if you're traveling for business professional whatever reasons there is always uh, a need for you to be able to wine and dine and obviously food as uh, you know in terms of food will become an important part and parcel of this particular you know sector so uh -huh. you're staying in a hotel whether you're traveling or taking a flight you get meals uh, which are served and obviously you know if the second most important thing that we see in the sector is hotels so obviously when you're traveling uh, which is the activity which you do in this particular sector tourism and hospitality for various reasons education business, professionalism you know even for politics any reason for which you travel you will always need a place to stay and that is where the concept of hotels bed and breakfast or you know, holiday inn and things like that actually come from. so hotels are a key part of this uh, particular sector we have also looked at uh, you know services which are events now events we typically cover at the mice but events could be different types so mice is one type of event which is the largest revenue driver under this particular you know main category but you also have events which are like for example i was mentioning is the the uh, dance film festival or the i for the awards which happen uh, you know in the hollywood nights and things like that like the past bafta awards that we talk about in the uk now these are big events for which you will see people travel a lot of actors actresses they travel across because all a lot of industry associated with the, the film industry actually travels and that is also classified in the events and what we do get to see is that this is also one of the key things under events you know which happen events is a third important cog when we look at um when we when you talk about you know hospitality and tourism sector uh, what we do say is okay events is an integral part and this has to be studied in a bit more detail now travel and tourism becomes an activity so this is important but within travel and tourism there are various routes various types that you can uh, use to do a travel to a particular destination that means that you go by land you go by sea you go by air so if it's air travel that's airlines if you go by ships or you know sometimes you take a cruise that is sea travel and when you travel by land for example if you go and take the eurostar or you know the palasan wheels or maybe some of the other uh, you know um, roads uh, transportation by road then you look at basically that app in particular now across the globe there are um you know um 
uh, tools and packages which are created under this particular provision wherein they utilize different types of um, you know travel and that travel primarily all happen for tourism or for leisure activities or whatever that we classify but that would mean that people tend to take different routes uh, so that they are able to either spend time or you know kind of look at a different experience and that is why sometimes you will say okay if i'm traveling to europe um, I'm going to be looking at doing a caravaning trip. So, for example, you end up hiring a caravan and you do a road trip, wherein you'll have the ability to be able to make stops and uh, you know stop over and travel as per your plan. But if you're planning on a uh, planning on a travel where you want to see a lot of countries, sometimes what you'll do is you'll take a package tour or a bus tour or a coach tour, and that would mean again you're not traveling for two months, but uh, or any sort of activity, but it is a form of travel that you're doing and you're taking a particular route either by sea, road, rail, or you know, by air. Now, there are other aspects of uh, this industry which are growing and they themselves form a category and we classify them in others because of the fact that um, they are quite big, but they're not as big enough in terms of revenue generators. At some stage, what we want to be able to do is, um, because they are only very specific niche activities, we want to club them into others. So when we say travel for education, you know, travel for education, yes, it is available in some countries. Like if you look at international students in the world for study or for a higher education or further education is the US. So about 1.25 million students travel to US every year on visas for study purposes. It could be various study purposes. But education is, uh, you know, I, I don't see a lot many countries which are identified as destinations for education. And that is why it's been clubbed into others. So UK, about you know about 0.6 million uh, you know students come in every year internationally study UK universities. Similarly, you look at France, Germany, some of the other destinations. But if I look at Africa, I might not see many countries or many uh, institutes or universities where students would want to go for travel. Canada is emerging. South America probably not. Australia yes. If I look at China emerging, look at Russia no. So you do not see a lot of travel happening from a point of view of students, that's why the students contribute revenue, but not that much revenue is actually, you know, under others. So if I look at UK in general or Britain in general, I think the education industry is worth about a billion pounds in terms of revenue that it brings in, but it could be classified as one of the things uh, which tourism brings into the UK. And this, because the significant part is smaller uh, you know, uh, it's a portion of the significant revenue which comes in under travel and tourism, but it's a smaller portion under education. That's why we will club it under others. So there are other areas which we look at, like human resources, you know, training. Sometimes people travel for two or three short uh, days for attending exhibitions. So you know, that's why these are kind of very niche functions, but they will be grouped into something called others. Now, one of the other emerging field which is coming across now is something called luxury services. And this is something we need, need to relate to is because now people in the developed countries or people which have the uh, you know economic capacity in terms of income and living standards, they are able to afford a second home or they are able to afford um, to stay in certain locations, which then tends to be that they have a second home in that location or a villa in that location or the idea of sharing of homes or services, you know, wherein you have a villa that is booked across, uh, you know, you're a part of that, um, you know, association and that allows uh -huh. you to have that villa or maybe, uh, you know, a cruise or something like that under those services of, uh, you know, which are luxury because these are things which only an average user cannot afford because of the income levels and, you know, the, um, uh, the status or some of these things require status and reputation, which is not there. But things like, you know, you have exclusivity or uh, exclusive um, kind of, uh, uh, let's put it this way, um, uh, you know, you have an exclusivity to use an air travel or a personal plane or a boat or a cruise or, for example, a share a villa or a hotel. And these are things which are all clubbed in luxury services, which a certain amount of people can afford. So to give you an example, um, if you look at the Middle East, and children, you might want maybe able to relate to because you've just come back from holiday there. You know, you look at Jubeira Beach and you look at the palms and a lot of developments which are happening in mid the Middle East, which are reclaiming land from the sea. But they have created very 
you know, luxurious apartments, villas, which a lot of people are uh, are buying, and those are being bought as a second home or as a holiday home. And in those cases, you will see that a certain set of people from all over the world are able to afford that, and that is what would kind of, kind of you know, come in under the classification of luxury services. Sometimes okay. you see, sometimes you also see that uh, you know certain companies would hire a corporate jet, for example, and these services are then only available top or the most senior members of the organization. So when you look at uh, you know the CEO or maybe the chief financial officer, CFO, these kind of people are having such luxury services, um, you know, within an organization. But the organization might not own that private jet, but they'll be able to take care. Uh, you know, take uh, those services at a very, very high cost from a company, uh, but they tend to be shared services. And those is those are things which we will tend to kind of, you know, club into uh, a sector called luxury services under this. Now, some people like Richard Branson, he owns his own island in the Caribbean. He owns also maybe an own apartment or a large luxurious villa in the palms uh, in, in the Middle East. So when they created a development wherein they created a world map, of uh, you know countries uh, and which of the countries were then sold to affluent people. So I think Richard Branson ended up buying Great Britain, uh, you know, as as the as the land in 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 that location in the Middle East. So these are very very influential people, and this is a category which brings in strong revenue, and that is why it is clubbed not with any other category, but as separate category as luxury services. But a very minute percentage of people have access to this, and I would say broadly classify, you know, the five or six different types or sectors within the uh, tourism and hospitality, you know, industry. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Is that clear enough? Yes, okay. it is. Good. Now, this should have come in earlier. The, you know, obviously it's a multi-billion dollar industry that relies on disposable income and, you know, time which people spend. And the reason why you're traveling in some location that you're traveling because you want to be able to, you know, look at making use of some of these facilities. And that is why, you know, um, it involves a spend of a lot of money. And uh, sorry, that's, that's fine. I thought probably the slide is misplaced. So that means that, you know, these are the broad sectors that we want to be able to look at. Now, what I've done is after that, ma- you, know, uh, you know, the image of the map that you've seen, which basically classifies them, I put together a few slides just to look at understanding them in a bit more detail. So the first one we look at, when you look at hotels, or uh, you know, when we look at lodging and accommodation, this is one of the key sectors within this industry. And obviously, you have a star rating system within this sector, which has emerged over the years. We have one star to up to seven star hotels. And sometimes, you know, uh, the, the rating system has been created because it differentiates the kind of products and services which each type of this hotel or the place of stay actually ends up providing. Now, vaguely, I haven't covered this in the slide, but vaguely, if I look at, I think when this star system actually started in the early 80s and the uh, late 90s, what it intended to do was that if you were traveling to destinations, and if it had 24-hour electricity and you know, uh, you know, heating and all, it was one star. But at some stage, it went to two stars because certain basic amenities which were added, like a coffee shop, which was available 24 hours during the course of your stay, then it became two stars. Then if it had, I think, one or two Michelin star restaurants or, you know, restaurants which catered to at least two or three different types of cuisines which were made possible, then the rating became three star. Four star was added when the swimming pool and, you know, some of the other facilities like air conditioning and, you know, um, availability of suites or certain types of suites came into the hotel industry. And I think it then added the four star rating. At five stars, you had a lot of other things which included luxury uh, living uh, within a destination. And then the six and the seven stars have had, got added on over the years because they might give you access to your own, uh, say, butler in the suite if you've uh, you know booked a suite, or in some cases, you know, you have access to your own pool or sauna and spa facilities. And you know, these were things which have got added on to the sector over the years under lodging or boarding. And because of which the star rating system has also evolved. And I think the highest rating currently is a seven star deluxe hotel, which primarily will have all these things 
available apart from say things like uh, you have an access to your own uh, driver butler a limousine you know these kind of features which uh, hotels try to differentiate um, and to in order to attract more visitors coming and staying and they want to be able to cater to different strata of the income levels or the disposable income which people have so lodging and accommodation you know is one of the most important part uh, you know of uh, this sector because it generates one of the largest amount of revenues so if you look at your package or your destination or income in your holiday package sometimes you calculate that, okay i'm going to be spending you know 50% on my stay and then 30% on my site and excursions and maybe 20% on food you do that division of budgeting is primarily because you want to be able to choose and look at the factors or uh, decision factors for your uh, you know um, so say the holiday or the Or, or the you know vacation that you're taking, and you kind of split your budget up. So the idea of doing that is you also, in somewhere, subconsciously or unconsciously, are splitting it up in such a way that you know that these are the major spends that you're going to do when you go on a particular holiday or on a on a vacation. Now, um, in terms of when we look at you know the uh, accommodation and lodging, we basically look at three different types, and they then uh, are classified. You know. either going by right this rating system that i talked about or sometimes you will see that um you know when i was young probably even example as a student i used to travel and the whole idea was we were on a we used to have a rucksack a sleeping bag and we used to you know make up uh, and go out on you know weekend trips so we were traveling nothing fancy no major hotel but we'll find a hostel like the ymca uh, hostels or you know shared accommodations and the idea was to try and save as much money on lodging uh, you know because you were only going to be there but most of the time was out and about or you know traveling to your family people so lodging was the bit which we had spent less the least amount of money or primarily if you could get to stay for free so for example stay with relatives sometimes go and stay with friends and you know that that is the concept where you kind of have a place to sleep overnight and then you're up and uh, up and uh, running and you're kind of you know in the city or in the hustle bustle uh, in terms of visiting uh, the city that you've traveled to then at the top stage you look at you know traveling where you want everything to be structured so you book maybe apart from hotels but you try and, and you are able to afford so you book maybe suites and there are different types uh, in terms of classification but here they provide you a lot of different facilities and sometimes you will see that breakfast is included and there were different concepts which came across so sometimes when you look at booking uh, hotels you know you have the am meal uh, you know which is the american breakfast uh, or the morning meals included and that terminology which kind of started off you know from the american uh, side in terms of having motels and you know drive drive away motels and things like that wherein the lodging actually included you know the breakfast and that then came across as a classification so over the years that definition has changed sometimes you have full board uh, you know as a classification you have half board full board means that you have all the meals included which is your breakfast uh, you know your lunch and your dinners half board mm-hmm. means you have only breakfast included or maybe you have an option of including only dinners and you know these are things which have changed over the years which have now become uh, a part and parcel of you know uh, accommodation or you know the hotel stay so yeah. has the classification system improved from one star it was just a uh, lodging and accommodation and it moved up i think a lot of hotels and these chains which have started to come across they started to offer some of these activities um, you know or include some of these things and food then became an integral part of your stay so lodging suites and resorts now resorts are primarily wherein you know people want to go across on um, we use a term normally which is vacation now there's a difference between a vacation and a holiday has have, have have you realized that is there a difference we use these terms interchangeably but actually if you mm-hmm. see, there is a difference between when you're doing a holiday and there's a difference between when you take a vacation okay is there a difference um hmm yes sir so there, there is definitely a difference but because these terms are used quite interchangeably what we've done is we've forgotten you know the the reasons why so when you look at um i think in terms of you know the the basic uh, literal definition uh, you know when we look at is if you go uh, to a particular place and you are going there for the first time and you do not visit that again 
I would to a certain extent say that that is a holiday because you do not prefer to go back to that location again. But if you go back to that location again and again over a period of time uh, or over a period of time, and I say number of years, then that tends to be a vacation that you take, uh, you know, uh, as a family or, you know, you go out to that location more often than probably uh, some of the other things that you do in terms of activity. So sometimes a vacation or a holiday can be used interchangeably, but there are subtle mm -hmm. differences between the two. And, you know, they tend to be, vacations tend to be regular occupations, which means you're regularly traveling to a destination and they are termed as vacation. But if you're going across as a traveler and you love traveling to different places, you would normally say, I'm taking a specific trip to this, or I'm making a trip to this location this time uh, during the summers. And that would be classified, you know, as a holiday because your reasons of going to that location might be changing. Sometimes it might be recreation. Sometimes it might, might be just resting, meeting friends. Or if you're going to a new location altogether, that will be having a very different reason. And that is where that classification of different types of tourism comes in, you know. So you might not want to go on a religious tourism or medical tourism again and again so these are short holidays that you end up taking because of a specific reason and you don't go to that location again but in certain cases like if i say you disneyland you went with your kids when they were young and three four five years old and then you go when they are in the teens and you also then can take a vacation when they are quite old but they have their own kids and you go as grandparents so that tends to be a vacation spot rather than a holiday spot so sometimes there's a difference which comes across and that is where you will see that difference also appearing when we say hotels and when we say resorts. So resorts basically have everything within uh, uh, you know, the location. And an example that I'll give you here just to, to give you an understanding is that if you take a city break, the reason why you're going for a city break is, and you choose a hotel in the center of the city or maybe a central location is because you want everything in terms of accessibility to be by walking distance and stuff. So uh -huh. in the case of casinos, for example, when you go and stay in a hotel when there's a casino or locations like Las Vegas or you know when you go to Amsterdam or you will basically see that they have designed these locations as resorts because they are cities within the cities and there is lots to do in terms of activities within the hotel or within the location. That is why they have a classification of a resort. That means you can pretty much do every kind of activity depending on the nature of it while you're booking. So if you're going in for, say, um, a holiday when you want to gamble, you know, you want to do most of the activities within the hotel, you'll probably end up going to a destination and choose a place which primarily will have all of these internally. Sometimes you book a holiday which is a resort because you want to be able to do some of the activities within that. But it is not necessarily for you to go outside that location. So Disneyland, if I give you an example, would classify as a resort because within the Disneyland uh, as, a, as a location, whether it's uh -huh. Paris, Florida, wherever you go, you will see that there are a number of hotels, there are loads of activities that you need to do and your package or the tour actually is only for Disneyland. It does not say Paris or if you have to look at a split, that you say that I'll go to Disneyland and I also want two days in Paris, then the tour operator would put together a tour for you or a travel agent would put it together for you because they are seeing two different uh, you know, packages. So it's not okay. really a type of a location uh, which provides accommodation, but here you have all the popular activities that you can do within the location without having to travel out. Large places or large hotels that you go to or destinations you go to, they try and retain you within the location because there's lots to do and you do not need to travel outside. Sometimes it does happen when you take family holidays so that you are able to take care of, you know, the parents being busy with the casino or maybe, you know, they have leisure activities that, that they can try out within the hotel. The kids are busy because they have, you know, these uh, rides and other things within that, within that location. And the resort might have their own private beach wherein the young couples or, you know, as you as uh, young people can go out and have your fun as well. And they need to be, you know, resorts. So if I also look at an example of say, you book holidays, specifically when you go to Ibiza, Mallorca, for example, or some of these locations in the Canary Islands, these are locations which are primarily within the location itself, you have a lot of activities to do. 
and sometimes what you do is you end up booking a hotel but in most cases people end up booking a resort uh, because what they want to be able to do is have the ability to be able to do all the activities within that location is that okay, okay? Yeah. yeah okay good stuff second part um, would be food and beverage so we looked at the you know the restaurants and then we classified this as a major generator for this industry what we do see is within this sector you have different types of things which are included so you have restaurants you have takeaways when you go to a location sometimes you want to go to have food in the hotel you say okay, i'll order over or i'll order a takeaway or i'll order a chinese if the facility is not within the hotel so then they tend to be you know one of the key things that people will do uh, when they travel is that they will need to have food you know you will wine and dine there is no way that you can survive without food even if you uh, you want to but you will look at various options for having food or you know um, um, basically you know enjoying uh, wining and dining so sometimes you will see that you can do it within the hotel you will go out to restaurants you know you will do takeaways fast foods there are lots of different types and all these are classified under you know the food and beverage which is an important core of this particular sector okay, okay. now just to identify um here what i've done is i put across some when you talk about lots of different types of you know uh, what we want to be able to do is under this sector let's specify very clearly what are the key categories so one is quick service uh, you know food which is often on the food and that study what we look at when we look at restaurants like mcdonald's kfc subway pizza pizza hut and things like that uh -huh. then there are the ones which are catering businesses that means if you are in a particular location you are traveling and it's a family or it's a full group which is traveling sometimes what you end up doing is you arrange for catering services to take care of that occasion and it normally seen in the case of wedding parties birthday parties or you know when a family or a group is traveling on a particular specific uh, you know uh, vacation or a trip so here you will see catering also happening because when we look at exhibitions when we look at you know large meeting events and uh, you know incentive trips sometimes you will see that they ask you to fill up a form so what kind of food would you like are you a vegan non vegetarian you know things like that and the key, okay. clear example of this is when we look at airlines industry right when you know you are taking a flight you know you always have to kind of sign off which what kind of meal would you prefer isn't it so airline yeah. industry yeah. within this sector relies on catering because it's food packaged food which comes in it is quickly served but there's a slight bit of difference between being prepackaged and being quickly served is because what you will see is when you are 33000 or 2000 feet up in the air there is no way that you can order food from mcdonalds or kfc so here the concept of, <laughs> here the concept of catering actually comes in wherein at the time of booking the tickets what you are able to do is define the type of meal that you want to have and obviously uh, airlines just can have the catering service to which all the meals everything comes in and then you know they are served when, when you are flying and then when you have full service restaurants sometimes when you go to locations uh, where you want to you have the ability to be able to kind of speak to the chef and the chef can take requests from guests to be able to prepare food when you look at room service for example that is a concept wherein you see that you have a menu available but you are within the menu you are still able to make it i'll do my you know can you do my toast so my sandwich is without this or can you add that and they still accommodate you because the hotel or the place that you're saying staying in has the capability of having a full service restaurant or a chef at hand and that is where they can prepare meals which basically would mean uh, you know which will suit to your styling or you know your preference and to a certain extent you can have you know uh, for special occasions say okay can we have the birthday cake being brought in or you know can that be done or a toast can be done and things like that you know so they would mean that sometimes when you book vacations you look at a full service restaurant would mean that something which can serve different types of cuisines has the ability to be able to you know uh, uh, order bespoke meals and from time to time it allows you to do wining and dining within the location of your stay is that okay, okay. Yeah. now also to drill down this into a bit more uh, would be when we look at you know sometimes 
think I, I'll, I'll probably put it this way that, you know, over the years there are travels, what I've started to do is I have looked at being very specific in terms of where you go and stay, what kind of things you get in terms of facilities and amenities. And then over a point in time, you also, because I'm a, I'm a vegetarian, I tend to pick or places wherein I'm quite sure that they have a lot of variety in terms of, you know, say, for example, offering vegetarian food or at least have one or two different types of restaurants where they have the ability to be able to serve, uh, you know, vegetarian food. So uh-huh. when we look at the various, uh, you know, um, if you are looking in the nitty gritty, then sometimes you go into those to be able to see that, okay, because I'm going for a vacation or I'm going for a holiday, and I go this you know, go to this place, uh, you know, quite often. What I, and the reason why I've chosen this place is that I know exactly what I can get in that location the food sometimes you look at paying emphasis and attention on what kind of food can be served or would be available to be served in that location so that is one of the key decision uh, you know making process that you look at when you kind of shortlist a hotel or a location to okay and when we look at the other side of the concept which is looking at uh, that sometimes you'd see the location that you try and book, but you go out and have meal in other locations, other hotels within the same location. And the reason when you do it, do do this is because you, you've heard about the restaurant or the reviews and those reviews about the restaurant kind of give it a bit of a classification that it's a, a Michelin star restaurant or a three star restaurant and you know, things like that. So here, the emphasis is primarily on, you know, the presentation, the management of the food, the kind of preference it serves, and the catering, uh, you know, going around, uh, you know, serving that food. So sometimes you say, okay, I want to look at a very classic setting or you want to look at a very posh setting. And the reason why you use these words or phrases is because you want to be uh, having dinner, which is exclusive or in some cases, you know, very special to make that event very special. So here the idea is that you can go to a lot of restaurants, get the meal, get the food, have, uh, you know, dinner or lunch, but sometimes you don't get and you look at classifications in terms of, you know, okay, and I want to have food or I want to have, you know, dinner in a very, um, you know, special restaurant. And that is where the emphasis within the food industry goes in to create the star system. Say, for example, the Michelin star system, wherein the focus and, uh, you know, the attention is on primarily the processes in terms of how food is prepared, where it is procured from, you know, how is the presentation done, what kind of are available so you have cocktails mocktails you know those kind of things and then um, you know in terms of how the food is served the ambience in general where you sit and have the food you know is it a location wherein you have a balcony view or a window view and things like that so that becomes important within this sector because that helps to drive prices or premium prices within the food sector so you can have a uh, you know dinner sometimes when you're out and about uh, you know in a certain amount of money but sometimes you have a three course meal or a five course meal, and then you end up spending an appropriate amount of money uh, you know, uh, because you're paying not just for the food, but you're paying for the premiumness of the location, the kind of uh, you know, catering, the serving it has, and obviously what are the processes through which the food is procured, prepared, and then presented accordingly. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Is that clear enough? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's look at uh, briefly, you know, the third part, which is which is travel and tourism. That means one of the activities through which, uh, why which you travel within the sector is, you know, uh, travel and tourism. So there are various types which I've explained that you do, and there are various modes of transport. So when I say types, I'm referring to the modes of transport. Here. And these transport could be train, you know, airlines, cruise ships. Sometimes you look at a combination of them which could be a coach uh, if you take a cruise you know you normally would travel overnight in the cruise but during the course of the day you have coach tours or you know uh, road tours which primarily take you into various cities and various locations when you're traveling on a cruise so the mode of transport also provides you know a large amount of contribution to this sector and depending on the mode of transport you choose there are lots of associated activities which can happen within the mode of transport. So, for example, um, you know, the in-flight entertainment system. Uh, this was a major innovation within the airlines, uh, cruise ships, 
wherein you have on demand movies and other things that you can uh, you know kind of look at and pay for or you know order and pay for and these things then allowed uh, people choices and choices meant that again different types of revenue could have been, could be collected from different type of customers traveling for uh, you know tourism purposes so sometimes you will see that within the airlines you have a economy seat you have a super economy or a world traveler and then you have a first class you have a business class and you have a lounge or a cabin as well in some of the flights now in the ACAT but again the idea is you are all traveling uh, you know when we travel to holiday we all travel on uh, you know if you are going to an overseas uh, or a different destination take a flight or things like that but again the segmentation of how much each traveler is spending is happening for segmentation in terms of features the traveler is looking at so some of them are able to travel business class some of them are able to travel first class on long haul flights some of them want a cabin or a kind of a facility where you can you know pretty much sleep overnight if it's a very long flight and in some cases you are traveling economy so here again differentiation in terms of collection of revenue can happen and that is why this sector has become important now um, i was trying to get together some facts for you know the airline industry um and looking at you know how many uh, airlines for example operate out of heathrow and what kind of taxes you pay so what i could find out from visit britain's uh, website is that when you look at heathrow and gatwick the two most busiest airports uh, you know heathrow obviously the most busiest in europe and there a plane lands and takes off every 26 seconds a plane lands and every 32 second a plane takes off so if there is a disruption you know uh, because of weather or you know for example in the last couple of days there were thunderstorms and you know things like that there was a bit of disruption in gatwick people were trying to get away for the half term uh, you know holidays here and that led to a disruption primarily for about i think good 20000 passengers that means cancel flight lost revenues and you know all those then had to be looked at by various agencies that we want to talk about you know uh, things like after at all you know and civil aviation so they then had to put together everything as quickly as possible so that the disruption was actually minimized but the disruption was caused by you know um, thunderstorms which is primarily climate related or sorry weather related and here um, you know this sector loses a lot of money but also has to adapt to changes which are happening because of the changing demand of the consumer in this particular sector so this is okay. one of the key components within the travel tourism hospitality sector because when you have decided that you want to take a holiday or a vacation what is going to happen is you will need a mode of transport and without mode of transport whether it's road rail airline cruise ship whatever it is this is an important you know peg in that particular uh, you know uh, uh, you know step for either taking a holiday or a vacation okay then entertainment industry now there are lots of different types of things that you uh, you know look at traveling for sometimes you're traveling for you know just for the purposes of entertainment so entertainment has become a very vast field within this sector and contributes a lot of revenue now there are different types of entertainments which people look at or activities which lead to entertainment which people look at experiences people look at some of the small things that we look at you know would be things like you travel for a hindu or you travel for example to a destination you know for a bachelor's party things like that now they mm-hmm. tend to be primarily for entertainment purposes you're traveling for say a christening party or a birthday party or a wedding occasion uh, that primarily tends to be falling under the category of entertainment the example okay. of casinos that i gave you earlier uh, you know was um or you know essentially is a very important part of the entertainment uh, you know settings within uh, you know the this particular sector so there are different types there are marinas you travel sometimes for entertainment which is sports and gaming um you know when you look at some of the derbies that you go to say for example a lot of um people travel and for football so when the teams are playing abroad in europe uh, for different matches they travel um you get tickets you know you're traveling primarily for sports sometimes people follow grand prix quite a lot and they go across you know uh, with their teams so you can afford so these are travels which are happening for sport purposes similarly you look at you know cruises you look at night clubs you look at bars they are all a part of the entertainment industry which bring in a lot of revenue you know as far as uh, uh, one of the, this sector is concerned 
Uh -huh. Let me look at the, the concept of timeshare. You know, this is a new thing coming into this sector. And the reason I put it up here as timeshare and uh, the fifth sector instead of others is that in others, it is quite self-explanatory why we are doing it. But timeshare as a concept is coming up increasingly as a modern concept in tourism in the last four or five years is because when you look at examples like Airbnb, you know, when you look at the cap sharing service, you look at, you know, some of these innovative uh, technological advancements which are coming in, you have the ability to be able to, you know, kind of go into a location, take a villa on a timeshare basis for the year, wherein you have a specific time wherein you come and stay in that hotel or in the villa. And those features, uh, you know, which are coming into this particular sector now are emerging primarily because people are looking at having some sort of an ownership of a place. And that ownership is coming under the concept of something called timeshare. Now, I might want to go to Spain every year and have a holiday. But over a point in time, I start to think that I come here, you know, once in two years, three years, I like this location. Why not have something which I can come to on a more permanency basis? Now, there are ways that you can go in and say, okay, I can afford to buy a villa or maybe afford to buy a, you know, an apartment there. But if it's not the case, then the concept of timeshare comes in, which, which allows you to kind of, you know, say that you're paying a certain amount of um, uh, association fees for the year. And then you have the availability of that uh, apartment, villa, condominium, whatever you call it, for a certain number of days throughout the year. And that is the concept of something called timeshare. And that is, is that is now which is coming in, you know, to a certain extent wherein people are now looking at this as a as a kind of a, a, a major thing within the sector, which is also leading and creating a lot of revenues for uh, you know, um, uh, the industry. And Airbnb is a concept which we look at primarily, which primarily has come out of this. And, you know, today you are able to kind of go to any city, any location, and what you can do is you can rather than uh, you know, the, the, what you can look at is you can go in and you know rather than booking a hotel or a place you can hire a house or a villa or an apartment and this is uh -huh. uh, something which is coming across to the timeshare service or basically a sharing service so a lot of people have you know kind of joined on to this service wherein you are then able to speak to the owner directly through the website arrange for a stay uh, on a price that suits you and then you know you at the end of the day leave that um, you know you stay in that place you leave that place as you inherited or you know you leave apart some expenses for cleaning and stuff and that allows you to you know um, have something which is um, you know on a sharing basis so timeshare is that concept which i've kind of mentioned here and it is becoming important because as people travel more and more for various reasons uh, they they are going to the same locations uh, which is coming across from research, especially the uh, travelers which are over the age of 45 and uh, you know 45 and over. They tend to travel to same locations uh, you know um, more often, and that is where the concept of time share is actually coming in. Now let's okay, go. Okay, so can I ask a question? Um, yes, because yes. throughout my study so far, I have been taught that you know timeshare is actually part of like an example of hotel or something. So is it that it shouldn't be classed under that, or should it be classed under its own umbrella and not under barely part of the lodging? See, as of now, in the if I look at uh, modern times for studies which are being conducted after 2015, time mm -hmm. period is now put across as a separate category. Okay. The reason being that there are unique business models which are coming up wherein um, that allows people to travel to a location and in, um, in the case of boarding and lodging of stays in general for hotels, people are able to arrange alternate accommodations using the use of uh, the concept of timeshare okay. and that is okay. quite prominently seen as of now with, within this uh, particular service of airbnb timeshare is also allowed in the case of you know when we look at holiday resorts we look at villas we look uh -huh. at convention centers so over the years convention centers yes obviously government creates the infrastructure or maybe a private public partnership creates the infrastructure but at the end of the year, what tends to happen is that it becomes synonymous as a uh, location for a particular event. And that then is hired or shared 
on a time time and revenue sharing basis to different organizers which want to host activities there and an example here which i would give you is for example when mobile world congress which i mentioned previously in some of the discussions like fira is a location which has come out of a pure business commercial perspective between public and private partnership uh, in spain between the government and the organizers now that location hosts the main event which they host twice a year uh, across the um, you know uh, in this seven uh, essay across the year um, in february and september i think or that is the main event but apart from that that location is still hired out or you know kind of leased out for doing other smaller events throughout the year but that mm -hmm. essentially as a venue is owned by say for example mobile world congress for a period of 7 to 10 years but on a time sharing revenue sharing basis they kind of hire that or let that venue go on hire for other smaller events happening in that location throughout the year so time okay. sharing is becoming an important contributor um, because a lot of infrastructure projects which are coming across they require a lot of uh, they require a larger break even in terms of time and in order to okay. get that break even uh, you know done sooner what the industry is now experimenting is with the concept of time share now the other example that i will give you is uh, which which i use personally is that i have a time share in the states with hilton hotel so i can go across for a 10 day holiday uh, you know across the year and i pay a fixed fee to hilton uh, to stay in about 600 different properties in the US. Okay, wow. And, th and this is done because they have a lot of unutilized capacity in terms of rooms and suites uh, mm -hmm. in the US now because, you know, when people start travel, the destination was very popular. But what is happening in the years is because the things that people are doing, you're traveling again and again. And you're familiar with now destinations. You are not willing to travel to that uh, destination again. So over yeah. the point in time, there is a bit of a decline that you see in the number of tourist numbers happening to a location, and that is where the, the large hotel chains and you know some of the big chains have now started to experiment with the concept of timeshare, saying that okay, in order to fill the unutilized capacity, or rather than leave the rooms open, what they want to do is create this association of timeshare and subject uh -huh. to you being a, a member, paying a membership fees for the year, that timeshare is available on a first come first serve basis. So I can't say that I want to go in, in on such a first date. You put the dates on the calendar, and if nobody else has chosen it, they normally tend to do uh, you know a timeshare with, say for a particular room with 10 to 15 people, and first on a first come first serve basis. If you book it, you get that for that day. Otherwise, or that time during during the course of the year. Otherwise, it is then you know obviously used by the hotel. Uh, you know, uh -huh. for guests and other services. So this as a concept is coming up. It still remains a concept, uh, you know, within uh, the accommodation and lodging site. But yes, uh -huh. it's showing great, uh, you know, growth in terms of, of revenue. And that's why I think, uh, you know, after 2015, this is being classified now as a um, as a concept separately, as against being clubbed with other categories. Okay. You have act, you have now this. You know, also available to look at uh, in things like you know private hire jets. A lot of people are now in that income level within the UK and you know other developed countries where you can hire a private jet for a certain number of days. So that also is timeshare, but that is owned by a company which runs the fleet or you know like luxury cars, for example, sports cars. If you want to drive, I know a lot of people in London when they come in for visiting, they try and drive a lot of luxury cars. And that also is under a concept of timeshare. You pay extensive insurance, and you pay, uh, you know, I think, um, from what I can remember, say for example, the hiring of limousine, for example, if you want to hire it out for a birthday party or for a night out, uh, you know, in the olden days, I think probably it was about three, four, five hundred pounds, uh, you know, for about two, two hours or so in London. So that kind of concept has been in existence for a number of years, but now that it is becoming popular. It is being segregated separately because it drives higher revenue, um, uh, you know, as a category with, with regards to some of the things and activities that it supports. Okay. Now, yeah. let's look at vertical and horizontal integration. Now, the definition, let's look at horizontal integration. Horizontal integration, it would mean that, you know, there are two, two players who are trying to merge the businesses and they offer kind of very similar services. 
So when you look at mergers of airlines, when you look at some uh, hotel chains merging together or working closely together to offer or build capacity, you see a horizontal integration because they are the same business. They are in the same business of lodging. They are in the same business of, say, for example, uh, airlines. Or you will see, for example, um, in certain cases, some restaurant chains they merge because uh, they do see that you know they are in the same business of providing or serving food. So horizontal integration typically happens when you will see two businesses come together to build capacity or to become uh, or to offer larger offerings. Like a tour operator might only cater to Western Europe, but there is a tour operator which has opportunities in Eastern Europe and the two operators actually decide to merge. They are going to be offering the same packages or same type of services, but because they merged and they offer the same, they are now able to cover a larger geography, both Eastern and Western Europe. So here you will see that a lot of significant mergers happen within this industry from time to time. And I think the last one that I can look at is the first choice group actually acquired, you know, the first choice travel agency because they said that we are a tour operator and in order to have a brick and motor model and have a lot of locations from which we can sell our own services because they have their own flights, they have tires with hotels, properties that they have across Europe. What it meant was that it was easier to have an integrated offering and get all the revenues into one basket rather than having it segregated across travel agents, you know, supermarkets or for example, airlines and hotels and others. So we saw horizontal integration happening when we looked at, you know, this as an example. And okay. this typically you know, is subject to a bit of a regulation in, in this industry. And that is what we will talk about in the subsequent slide. So when we look at horizontal integration here, the key takeaway that we want to look at is there are two businesses, two industries which are merging or are coming together uh, to kind of gain a bigger market, get a larger share in the market, but they offer pretty much the same services. Now, when we look at vertical integration here, what we are looking at is slightly different. What we, what we find is that the typical example of vertical integration would be here a company is trying to buy out a similar organization, but it provides certain distinct services within that value chain. An example here would be um, when I look at Virgin uh, Group in particular. Now, Virgin Group, um, has lots of different, uh, you know, kind of services they provide. So they are in a, they also have trains, um, but they did not have any uh, traction in what you call the road, uh, you know, connectivity or, for example, any, um, let's put it this way, services that they were to provide in on, on the road. So what okay. the Virgin Group did was they did a strategic tie with Stagecoach Group, which is basically a large coach company in the UK. And they provide mm -hmm. unique services um, uh, in terms of you know travel across cities, and that is Stagecoach. So they what they did was they went into partnership with Stagecoach, so that in their offering they had air travel, they had rail travel, but did not have road travel. So what they did was they went into a sector wherein they now are able to offer because of this partnership with Stagecoach, air, mm -hmm. rail, and transport by road travel as well. So <laughs> what they tried to do is vertically into all the three different types of travel which people can do when they travel for either vacation, holidays, or whatever business, personal, professional reasons. So this is an example of vertical integration. Vertical integration can also be seen, if I give you a different example, uh, just to understand this, would be that when you look at car manufacturers, what car manufacturers typically tend to do is that if you see uh, a large manufacturer like Mercedes, for example, over the years, this car manufacturer has now been, the, the group holding is Daimler, uh, you know, Mercedes. So this is a group which owns a lot of brands under the Mercedes group. So they own, um, you know, let me give you another example, but within the car industry, because I'm aware of that. So when we look at, say, for example, Volkswagen group, which was also in the news, and I think you should be able to relate to that. Why was Volkswagen in the news in the last uh, couple of months? Anybody recall? Uh -uh. I'm not too sure, not too sure on your side there in Tobago, Antonio, but yeah, in the US. Chelsea, any idea in terms of why was Volkswagen uh, in the news in the last couple of months? No, I can't remember. Right, okay. 
there is a diesel emissions scandal, car emissions scandal, which has erupted in the industry, which is one of the largest scandals which has come out. And Volkswagen Group was implicated in this scandal because he said that in order to promote the diesel cars or diesel engine cars, fuel cars, the group had kind of suppressed, uh, you know, reports of diesel emissions uh, from their cars. And this has led to a $20 billion write-off, which Volkswagen is now currently serving, um, you know, because they have found anomalies in the emissions, which the car manufacturer actually initially printed and promoted. Uh, were lesser as compared to what actually the emissions are from the diesel car or diesel fuel cars. So this has led to a lot of recall of cars in the US, all over the world, in, in Europe, in China, in other locations as well. And Volkswagen Group has been asked to put aside $20 billion in order to deal with this particular scandal. Now this, uh, so over the years, that is a different part. The reason I'm explaining this would be vertical integration. So Volkswagen as a company, you know, obviously is just, they make Volkswagen cars. But over the years, what they had done was they manufacture passenger cars, which were very well respected. Uh, you know, they were known for value for money, fuel efficient cars. But over the years, what they tried to do is in order to create an image wherein they have a larger segment that they can serve for customers, what they have done is they have taken up and acquired a lot of luxury brand cars and brought it under the Volkswagen banner. So a lot of us probably don't know that, say, for example, when we look at Porsche as a brand, Porsche as a brand is owned by Volkswagen Group. So when we look at Maybach, which is again a British brand, but is owned by Volkswagen Group. So what they did was, in order to look at catering to markets that they were expanding, like China in particular, they wanted to have an offering of premium luxury cars within their own brand name or within the, under their own group. So what Volkswagen did was, they it's not happened in the last 10 years, but they've over the last three or four decades, acquired a lot of different brands of uh, car manufacturers in order to bring them under their own group so that they have a very um, large offering catering to value for money customers, economy customers, premium economy customers, premium and luxury car uh, customers. So they own a lot of brands now which are primarily cars uh, for the common man from there to cars which are the most luxurious cars, you know, as far as, you know, uh, the car manufacturing business is concerned. So Volkswagen also owns, if I'm correctly right, uh, right the Audi uh, car uh, group as well. So it is the largest car manufacturing group outside Toyota which is Japanese manufacturer, but what they've done is with the acquisition of so many different brands of cars, the Porsche, the Maybach, they also own, I think, uh, um, uh, the Swedish car manufacturer, which is Skoda now, and and they up to up till Audi. So that means they are able to give now uh, offerings to all different types of customers, different types of cars, uh, you know, and that is an example of vertical integration. Is that okay? Yeah. Let me just double check in terms of my information. Audi is owned by, I think, I'm pretty sure the Volkswagen Group. So, yeah, Audi owns the Volkswagen Group. Uh, so, uh, is owned by actually the Volkswagen Group. So, they are one of the biggest manufacturers. And obviously, you know, the reason why they acquired some of these brands over the years was to be able to widen their offering. And because they've gone into different types of segments, but more or less similar types would be primarily looking at, you know, something called, uh, you know, integration, which they've done. So what they've tried to do is bring in different types of uh, car price points to be able to offer to customers. And that will be, you know, an example of an integration why you see mergers and acquisition happening. So when we look at Virgin Group doing a partnership with Stagecoast, you look at vertical integration because they were not into road transport, but air and rail, and they've gone into something totally different as a category. And that is vertical integration. But when you look at similar businesses acquiring, um, you know, similar and are then offering similar services, you will see that as horizontal integration. Now, let's look at a few quick brief slides, you know, which I put together and they are something that you will go through at your end. But, you know, when you were looking at mentioning some key, uh, you know, agencies within this sector, you look at one which is called after. 
and this basically is an agency you know which looks at um, you know it's a trade association which looks at um, you know bringing together the tour operators and travel agencies and their responsibility is to primarily grow the business and they've been going for about 60 years a lot of holiday uh, agents to travel agencies they advertise after logo because it is considered synonymous with you know a, a kind of a consistent offering and they then put measures in you know um, over the years they put some measures in legislation in place which actually looks at dispute resolution amongst customers uh, consumers travel agencies and tour operators okay mm-hmm. now there's something called federation of tour operators which is se- separate from apta and apta is tour operators and travel agents together but tour fto is primarily just tour operators now here they are more interested in kind of you know looking at developing overseas destinations so fto's in the uk which is an organization currently works with a lot of tour operators um, to kind of facilitate uh, you know the availability of destinations where uk tourists would want to travel and say for example when you look at traveling outside the uk or when you look at for the destinations you will also see that in some cases you know some of the tour operators and travel agents would advertise an fto logo because they want to be seen as a uh, part of an organization which is also regulated and they are able to offer you know consistent packages uh, and meet requirements which are set by uh, you know the different organizations agencies worldwide we also look okay. at something called the association of independent tour operators or aito Now, AITO is slightly different from FTO and APTA is because AITO is formed of smaller companies or smaller operators. What they felt was when this this particular association was created, they felt that our voice in terms of you know the small businesses which constitute travel hospitality sector in particular, like the beds and breakfast, and you know you look at other ancillary factors which work with this sector, they kind of said that our voice is not heard within. the fto's and the larger organizations so what they did is they ended up creating something um, um as a independent you know organization called ito and they kind of then looked at um, you know specialist services or smaller services which were not taken care of when we look at national tourism in particular so uh, you will see that when you look at tourist information brochures within uh, the uk or any particular country when we look at city breaks we look at you know um, uh, popularizing of tourism related activities within a particular city here you will see the uh, you know the workings uh, closer workings of the association of independent tour operators because they are more interested in national tourism or a tourism in a particular location because of the size of the business and the size of the operators that they are um cool. last but not least i think i would just quickly look at something called the um, you know civil aviation authority now this basically regulates any sort of you know airports we have something called the airports authority okay. uh, in some places it's called the civil aviation authority their responsibility uh-huh. is to keep the airports uh, you know safe up and running and they are a key part of this particular sector which derives a lot of revenue when you travel to locations you pay a tax you know on your flight ticket when you when you're traveling you're paying some sort of an airport tax and the reason why you pay that airport tax is because there are lots of other services which are related and maintain in the airport things like security or baggage handling you know uh, these are things which the civil aviation authority or the airports authority actually looks at and that is where they are a key part of uh, you know um, and then you know this particular sector because if security lapses happen or if the packages are not uh, you know handled properly because these are ports on which a lot of transition or travel of uh, you know passengers happens they become an integral part and obviously you have lots of law and legislation around this uh, in order to mm-hmm. ensure uh, you know uh, so for example safety of passengers sometimes you see and you hear no liquids allowed on flight you know this is not allowed and these are things which are you know created as code or law by the uh, aviation authority operating in a particular country okay yeah. now there are some other things which are things like the trade description act like in the uk in particular if you book anything you have the right to cancel or you know uh, get a full refund or a claim if you book something within 14 days or 28 days and these are part and parcel of you know some of the acts which have been created to um, you know keep the consumer uh, uh, you know uh, you know safe or protected 
when you book your holidays. So some of these things are put together, you know, just for knowledge sake, so that when you are traveling next or when you're taking a holiday next, at least you will get to see these guidelines printed on your airline ticket, your tour operators, you know, itinerary. And this is where they have to comply with this legislation so that, you know, sometimes if you have a cancellation or if you have issues, then you are able to claim back uh, some of those money, you know, because of insurance or, you know, uh, related okay. services. So there is a EU package uh, travel regulation which is in place. There is something called the Trade Description Act, which protects you against unfair services or falsified information if it is being given by a tour operator. And it basically says, uh, you know, you're going to a hotel, you'll have five star facilities, you'll have this, this, that, uh, and that. But you end up going to that location and you find that this is missing, that is missing, and it is not there as per what the description was given. Then in that case, you can, you know, go back and sue the operator or ask for a refund under the Trade Description Act because the description of the product as described in the as described when it was sold to you is not exactly mm -hmm. uh, the way it was described so it's falsified information and that comes in the consumer protection act um you know in the uk is pretty standard because it uh, allows customers to return uh you know a particular product if they find it to be you know not fit for purpose or the pricing is different sometimes you see concepts like these being applied uh, if you shop at large retail stores and you have a price match you know, uh -huh. if I say that I find this thing, uh, you know, on Amazon and you're selling uh, on your website at this price, can I do a price match? So this uh -huh. kind of things are covered under the Consumer Protection Act so that you're not being, uh, you're not paying an extortion price, um, you know, for a particular product or a service when it is available uh -huh. elsewhere, uh, you know, at a certain price. Okay. Now, Hi. let's look at very briefly, uh, you know, the last part, which is, why do we need classification when we look at tourism and tourism activities? Uh -huh. Now, what I've done is I've put this slide before it, um, you know, because what I want to do is I want to kind of make it clear that why do we need classification? You know, the reason why we need classification is sometimes you would say, um, you know, an example at home is that, um, you know, your kids might come in and say, okay, I need to do this. You ask them a reason why you want to do this. And the reason why you want you ask them this question is because you want to know the background or the reason why they are asking for this. So when we look at you know relating it to tourism um, in particular, sometimes it is important when you fill up those surveys or you know feedback questionnaires that why did you travel to this destination or you know uh, why did you book this hotel or why you looked at ordering this particular service. They want to look at the various categories of why and how you want uh, you know you have traveled or what are the clear reasons behind why this was taken and that is why classification is important because next time this industry basically thrives on the fact that it thrives on something called customization so if you are giving an experience which is bringing across um, you know a delight um, you quality of service, something which uh, gives you a reason to remember uh, the location or the uh, service that you've received is all dependent on something called customization. And the more you get customization done in this uh, you know, industry in terms of learning the preferences, the things that you like, the things you don't like, they, that allows the players in this industry to offer you services which are meeting your requirement and your criteria. And to a certain extent, that is one of the reasons why classification is required. So the purpose has to be defined and why you're taking the trip, why you're going, why are you going to this location again, what did you particularly like about uh, and, and the reason why you're booking this are all reasons why they want to understand how best they can collect this data to put uh, some sort of a classification in place. And that helps them to provide, you know, quality services or create experiences which you will remember and that will keep you bringing back uh, to this location again and again. So okay. that is one of the reasons why you look at classification. Now, how do we do classification? So we've understood why we want to classify, but how do you classify? You know, you see the difference? We are talking about why do we classify and now we are saying how do we do classification? So classification can be done to determine why you're taking the trip. What are the reasons why you want to take this trip? Sometimes you classify, uh, you know, on the basis of um, expenditure that you want to do in a location. 
So sometimes you will say that I want to book a holiday, but I want to book it within say two thousand dollars, or you want to say I want to book it between five thousand dollars and I want to pay for everything: travel, flights, you know, food, and sightseeing. Uh, sometimes you classify this from a point of view of saying, okay, I'm going for business travel, or I'm going for attending an occasion, I'm going to attend a function, I'm going to attend a wedding. So you look at various reasons of why you want to classify and understand why the person is traveling. And if you know the reasons why the person is traveling, sometimes you can create the trips around that reason, around those reasons to be able to ensure that the quality of the delivery in terms of experience which they are expecting is there. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, from an industry standpoint of view. We do two types of classification when you the traffic of uh, for tourism purposes. One is personal, the other is business, and the personal side of things could be classified under these categories. Now we briefly mentioned and alluded to these categories in the previous session. So things like holiday, leisure, and recreation, visiting friends, education and training, health and medical benefit, or you know uh, reasons for medical uh, tourism. You look at religious reasons for travel. Shopping. Sometimes people want to go across on, you know, during the Christmas holidays here in the UK, you have flight tickets from London to uh, London Heathrow or Gatwick to New York, uh, probably at a, as low as 229 because people want to go across and travel uh, and do Christmas shopping, uh, you know, in the US. So you have various reasons why people want to travel, and sometimes they classify as reasons for traveling to be shopping. And sometimes it is transit. That means you're in between trans, uh, you know, airports and you're taking flights, and that could also be reasons that you want to go in and, you know, maybe stay in a location only for a few hours, meet, a, uh, you know, meet people for business reasons. You have this business, the, you know, what you call the business lounges in most hotels now, wherein some of these meetings do tend to happen, and those are happening when you're in transit, when you're traveling, but you're in transit. You're not at your main destination. So okay. some of these are self paid but what I've done is because holiday leisure and recreation is one of the biggest activities which could be classified under you know personal reasons for travel. I've kind of split this up into different activities. So you're going for college recreation, which could be sightseeing, could be going to you know visit some uh, you know architectural things. It could be for recreational purposes, entertainment. You might go and stay in a hotel uh, which is peace and quiet and not go out of the hotel that much. You could go out and do some sporting activities. Like sometimes you go to Dubai and other places, you know, you go across and experience, uh, you know, desert safari or we, if you go to a beach resort, you do scuba diving and, you know, water sports, you know, those, those kind of things. So the classification helps tailor packages to meet the tourist needs. That's the main key takeaway take of this slide. Okay. If I know why you're traveling to a location and what are the main reasons for traveling to that location, I can tailor those packages and make those available to you so that I can get the maximum revenue when people travel to that destination. Okay. So business and professional, there are lots of reasons why, again, we look at business and professional travel. And here again, I've kind of summarized them in, in you know, so small circles. So you're going for MICE, which is uh, meetings, conferences, or exhibitions. You are sometimes uh -huh. going to do, uh, uh, going to do and attend trainings. So a lot of people actually look at training events, which they host, which are very close to convention centers, airport, because the, they are only attracting visitors or tourists coming in from companies and organizations primarily for the purpose of training or you know education. You will also see sometimes charitable work happens on, on, on under this particular category. For example, natural disasters, uh, if they occur, then there's a large responsive force which actually goes across from any particular country or a particular destination to you know meet those requirements. But that is again uh, you know professional reasons wherein you're going to you know provide aid, medical aid, things like that. And then business travel also be for sports purposes. You know, could be for recreational activities to a certain extent. When you see CEOs of organization, when you see G20, a good example of this would be the Davos conference, which happens in, the, in, in Europe every year in Davos. And that is a culmination where you have a lot of bureaucrats, you know, top officials from the uh, from the government offices, countries, prime ministers, president, and also the CEOs of organizations. They converge, have a conflict 
which lasts for about five to seven days, and they discuss a lot of things, um, you know, during that, which is policies, uh, you know, economic growth, you know, things in terms of investment, business deals, and that happens because of business as well as professional business. But for in some cases, it could also be recreational because the CEO of the company is going there to do some guest lectures or you know some guest seminars, and it could be a holiday come business week. So, okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now let's look at we do classification. There are lots of challenges. Now there is no perfect classification of why people travel, and you know what could be the reasons why they travel. Sometimes you end up doing an exit survey or a survey at the end of the stay uh, at the end of your stay at the hotel. It says, uh, did you travel for personal, or professional, or business reasons? And sometimes you will see in uh, travelers end up ticking all the three boxes because you might have had a meeting, one odd meeting when you were there, and uh, you know mostly your travel would have been for personal reasons, which is holiday. But you end up doing a tick on the business also because you had one or two business meetings. So there are lots of challenges sometimes. You know um, the classification uh, comes under, and these challenges are primarily because if you are able to predict and if you are able to understand the person is traveling and why you are frequently traveling to that location then the hotels then have the ability to be putting you into something uh, of what is called the loyal programs so if you go and stay in a hotel time and again you become a loyal you get a loyalty card and you are able to get points and you know they are able to understand your billing and everything and then cater to your services accordingly if i go and stay in a particular hotel i know i am coming in for business stay and i normally come in the uh, mornings uh, you know check in and then next day i leave but you end up utilizing three or four different types of services for example a long term service for example your um, um, you know your uh, you might only have a dinner in that location because when you check in the mornings you go into the venue and then you have you come back in the evening you only have dinner and the next day you check out you end up taxi because you will always end up booking the taxi from the hotel from the hotel to the airport and this classification then helps tailor some of the services and packages that people end up having under the loyalty programs and that is why classification is required because it helps predict revenues help predicts habit and uh, you know the preference the customers have when they travel to a particular destination now what are the challenges the challenge is to understand these classifications sometimes you will see that if you you know do exit service and question is and you pick a lot of categories it might be difficult for them to say that whether you travel for personal business or professional reasons and that means they are not able to get a conclusive result the other thing is sometimes you will see responses are dependent on what information is provided by the visitors so uh-huh. if you want to take a feedback that okay was the room uh, you know service okay was the room um, uh, meeting your expectation so you see some of these questions are quite open ended and sometimes they are also with multiple choice uh, options given to you because what they want to do is they want to exactly fit you into a category whether the uh-huh. room was meeting your uh, expectations yes or no or not applicable right okay. if they know if they say yes uh, it was but and then sometimes they say maybe then what is happening is it is not allowing them to collect data which then can be put into some sort of a format for you know reusage or you know doing some analysis now mm-hmm. things you will also see that um you know when you look at visa system that also helps to do a bit of classification in this sector a lot of countries have lot of different types of visas that you can get when you decide to travel to a particular location now mostly yep. all visas are classified as tourist tourist visas um in the uk for example i'll give you an um, uh, you know as an example i'll mention uk now uk has i think five or six maybe not six seven or eight different types of visas and the reason why they want to look at this classification is they want to understand why you are coming into the country and then they can try and predict what kind of services you would use within the sector so when you look at there is something called a tier 1 visa and tier 1 is a entrepreneur visa that means people who have 5 million 10 million 2 million or 200000 pounds can come into the country and then settle within a span of 1 to 5 years but then this, this helps the government to understand whether the person are going to be when the business or the organization coming in or the person coming in will be able to bring revenue to the country will it create employment how much employment will it create and for how long it There are tier two visas, which are work permits. There are tier four visas, 
maybe a clear five details which are primarily i think for uh, people who want to come in and gain experience within the sector there are diplomat visas there are uh, tourist visas and i think mm -hmm. there's one more category which is uh, um, i think diplomat visas so there are six or seven types and the reason why it helps is because this classification of visa system helps the immigration of officials understand why you're visiting the country so classification sometimes is important but when you look at the category like tourist visa you get that for three months six months in some cases like the us you apply for a visa for the first time you might get it for 10 years if you apply 10 years but in okay. some cases it's like the lottery system you might get it or you might not get it at all in some countries they have visa on arrival that means you can come in can have uh, you know you can stay in the country for three days or a week but beyond that if you need to stay then you have to apply for a specific visa so okay. this classification in general is also uh, you know applicable for this industry and one such type of classification which happens at the port of entry happens at the immigration and that is why you will see that uh, when you look at tour operators and package operators which offer packages the difference between travel agents and tour operators becomes distinct in this case is that the tour operators are able to uh, arrange for visas as well if you need one but the travel agents aren't able to because they do not look at immigration or immigration related matters they only look at selling you uh, you know stay and hotel stays and uh, flight and uh, you know those kind of things so classification you know is important from that point of view but some of the challenges are that when you come in even in our tourist you might be doing business activities, uh, you know, which are not allowed, but you might still be transacting business or meeting people, you know, under the context that you are a tourist. And that is where the challenge of classification, you know, comes in into this uh, particular industry. Is okay. that okay? Good yeah. stuff. Now, so I think I've covered, um, you know, this part, which is primarily to do with uh, learning outcome three. It's taken a bit of a time out, but I think it was a, it was a large learning outcome in any case, uh -huh. you know, which required for me to cover a couple of things. So any yeah. questions on this so far? Um, you know the horizontal and vertical integration. Yeah. Um, would um the merging of like senses and agile would that pass as a horizontal integration? That will be yes, because they are similar businesses. And they offer okay, similar yeah. services in the market, it will be horizontal integration, yes. Okay. Anything else? Uh, that was my only question. Anything else from your side, uh, Antino? No, I think the slides are actually making everything much more easier to understand, though. Because I, from the outset, I did not know what vertical and horizontal integration was. So I think it basically made me understand better now. So basically, um, I think I'll, what I'm going to also do is send you a bit of a handout on the vertical and uh, horizontal integration. And that would primarily, you know, give you some more points. I have covered. Uh, you know, I think I put some more details, you know, on the slide from that handout. But you know, just as a handout, it will be easy for you to, do, um, to understand the concept, and that's something which I'm going to send, which I think is a bit uh, you might need a bit of help on. But apart from that, I think the roles and main main sector types quite self-explanatory. I think it's an extreme kind of thing mm -hmm. in terms of doing the assignment should should be okay. And classify is also easy because the basically classification is only two types. But determine uh -huh. the bit which you need to show explicitly by taking an example when you do the assignment as well. And that's the reason why I will send you a handout on this uh, along with the copy of the presentation. I didn't yeah. email that to you yesterday, but I'm putting it on the module just after the session. So you should be able to access it from there. Okay. Okay. That's brilliant. Um, now, what I'm going to try and do is I think only one learning outcome is uh, left now, which is destination management. Now, I have prepared slides for this because, as I mentioned to you earlier when we started this particular unit, uh, OTHM is kind of you know muddled in a couple of uh, uh, you know key parts in this, and this is normally a separate unit or a module when you study uh, in the course. So uh -huh. what I'm going to try and do is for destination management, I'm going to put the slides which is for the LO4 on the Moodle today itself. 
And if you go through that, and if you do feel that we need to do a session, or if certain things are not clear, then we will do a session next week, you know, on Saturday to try and bring this unit to a close. But if not, and everything is clear, you can drop me questions, uh, you know, if there are questions on that, and I'll try and see if we can answer. But if I do feel that, you know, you're struggling with that, then we'll do a session, uh, you know, on this uh, next week. Otherwise, we'll try and bring this unit to a close. Uh, destination management is a broad topic, which has about four or five different learning outcomes. But here, the idea is you want to only understand this as a concept, why it is important within the industry, and what are the various roles and responsibilities or functions which come out of destination management. And that is the, uh, it's, a, it's an overview understanding that you need to have rather than a detailed understanding. So that's why I'll put in the slides um, for LO4. And uh, they, they generally will be self-explanatory, but I will put in a handout which I've prepared, which basically says, assess the needs of destination management. The other two are explain and outline, which are theoretical, but assess one, I will put a handout out so that you are able to understand why the concept of destination management has arisen and why this is becoming a serious uh, you know, business within the sector, because a lot of people are now um, you know, looking at developing uh, basically economic reasons that some locations in the world you will see are now totally dependent on tourism revenue and that mm -hmm. is why destination management as a concept is important for them because that um, uh, the the concept of the activity of tourism actually generates more than 50 to 60 percent of the revenue in that location so when you look yeah. at islands like maldives madagascar you look at ibiza you know locations which are totally dependent on tourism in terms of tourism and tourism revenue and the activity around tourism, there the concept of destination management is being applied at the governmental level or at the federal level. And that is why we need to understand this concept and an overview of this is in the learning outcome portal. Sure. Okay, brilliant. So you enjoy the rest of your day, uh, both of you, and I will catch up with you uh, either on emails and if required, then the next week on a session to cover LO4. Okay. So, Thank you. I know one other quick thing which I'll mention, um, the feedbacks on assignments will definitely come this week because what we're trying to do is uh, squeeze in a visit, uh, you know, with OTHM for certification, which will happen after the 15th of June, but before the 30th. So, uh, and tentatively what we're looking at doing is 